Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to ASML's 2022 Investor Day. I am Skip Miller, Head of Investor Relations. Um, I want to thank you all who have made the journey over here to Veltoven. It's so nice to see many of you in person. It's been a long while. And for those joining in the webcast, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, as far as before we go through the agenda, I would like to first maybe walk through some of the housekeeping items. First, uh, safety, the exits here and in the back. Uh, regarding restrooms, uh, they're over on this side, uh, on the next floor up. And if you uh, would please put your phone on silent or airplane mode now, just a reminder to avoid any uh, interruptions. Presentations that will be given today will be posted on the uh, website at the end of the day. And regarding Q&A, we're going to have two things here. First, for those here in the audience, uh, when we get to Q&A, raise your hand. We'll have people in the aisle, we'll have microphones You'll come down and get a chance to uh, ask questions. And we'll try to mix some in for those joining uh, on the webcast. Uh, there, You should see on your screen a area where you can ask a question during the presentation. Please submit your questions. We will uh, take those and we will weave those in as part of the uh, Q&A session. If you could, you don't need to, but if you could leave your contact information in case we don't get to your question, we can address it, uh, follow up from the IR team. So with that, uh, I'd like to move to the agenda. Uh, today, we will uh, first have our CEO, Peter Winnick, who will talk about the end markets, wafer demand, and what we're going to do in terms of capacity, followed by our CFO, Roger Dawson, who will talk about the financial model, business model. Uh, Peter will wrap up with closing uh, around 3 p.m. We'll take a 30-minute break, and then we'll move to uh, the Q&A session. Um, we'll have our members, six members of our ASML management team will join and we'll be here to address QA. So we'll have an hour time there. So we'll wrap up the formal program at uh, 4.30 p.m. Uh, as far as those that are in the audience, uh, we will then have a review of the agenda after Q&A that will take us through a dinner at 8 p.m. Okay, so now before I start, of course, we have to read all this. So if you'd read along with me. Um, no, I won't make you do that. But before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that comments made by management during the event will include forward-looking statements within the meaning of the federal securities laws. These forward-looking statements involve material risks and uncertainties. For a discussion of risk factors, I encourage you to review the Safe Harbor Statement contained in our press release and presentations, which will be posted on our website at asml.com. Now, as it's been over four years for many of you, if you, and some of you may not have even been here, but those that were here back in 2018, as you came in, you probably looked and said, wow, this place has really grown. You see a lot more people. Um, so before we start with Peter's presentation, we'd like to do a qu quick intro video just to show kind of where we've come from, how we've evolved, and how this place has grow grown as we prepare for the expansion and future growth of this company. Thank you. <laughs> ASML is driving the technology of tomorrow. Our customers depend on our products to bring their cutting edge technology to life. To meet their needs, we invest in the future. We invest in research and development so our machines can deliver the smallest features and the highest yields. We invest in our factories and facilities around the world so we can meet our customers' increase in demand for our products. The number of machines we plan to deliver in the coming years continues to grow. We also invest in our workforce, the people who give life to our values, challenge, collaborate, and care. They come from more than 100 countries to work together and advance ASML's mission. Our values push us to invest in being a good neighbor and global citizen. From supporting art preservation to minimizing our environmental impact, our initiatives lay the groundwork for sustainable, long-term growth. 
To make our vision for the future a reality, we need to collaborate across departments, across sectors, and across continents. Our investors enable the innovation that advances our technology and creates our value. Together, we will lead the semiconductor industry into a sustainable and highly profitable future. Welcome to Investor Day 2022. So, thank you. You know, uh, first of all, I'd like to reiterate what you said, Skip. It's great to see you all. I mean, uh, I've just met a couple of old friends, you know, people that we've been seeing for the last decades, you know, been following ASML um, um, pretty closely, and uh, have also seen the growth of the company over the last decades. Um, and why is this uh, introduction video important? Because actually, it, it uh, you know, shows growth. And uh, uh, growth is, is, is particularly important uh, because it will drive what we will do the next decade and beyond. And I'm going to talk um, a bit about um, what we see and um, you know, probably mentioning the obvious from time to time because when I talk about this, these developers that we all know of, but we try to somehow translate that into the business that we're in and, and, and what we ultimately is the demand for wafers. Because, you know, we're, we're a semiconductor equipment company and we process wafers. And ultimately, that's the driver for the size of the company and uh, the volume in growth. So I'm going to talk about uh, megatrends. And this is where you say, yeah, yeah, Peter, please, please move, move on. I'd like to see the numbers. But I'm going to, to give you some numbers in that sense. Yeah? Um, um, and then we'll translate that, that into wafer uh, you know, demand and why we need that uh, capacity. And then, of course, Roger is going to translate that into things that you're really interested in, that is the numbers. Now, clearly, these uh, global trends, uh, it, 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 they, I, I cannot repeat that enough. I mean, trends that we are currently seeing, we didn't see a couple of years ago. Now, people ask me the question, though, why didn't we see this? massive and big demand on our products coming because we simply do not connect all the dots. And it's still a challenge today to keep connecting all the dots, but it's the value of Moore's law, which is basically reducing the cost per function yeah, that will drive our business and will create these building blocks for growth and for solving some of humanity's biggest challenges. And we are a strong believer in, in this. Yeah? And Moore's law is, is alive. It's still alive and kicking. And it's about the cost per function. And we all know if the chip gives you more functionality, more value, then it creates cost. We're going to create applications and solutions. And that's happening. I mean, things are actually happening across the globe. Um, and, and we'll talk about those trends. But generally, if we go through it, we believe that it will translate into, let's say, a CAGR for, from 2020 to 2030 of around 9%. And, and that drives the increased demand for wafers, which if you translate that, is about 6.5%. Now you can say, why isn't it 9%? Well, because of the value. The value, we think, will rise faster than the cost, which is reflected in the wafers. Yeah? So that values... Wafers will become more valuable. Yeah, and in order to do that, just in summary, the 9620 is the number that we gave to you in April of this year, and we're going to reconfirm that throughout the meeting. So first, the megatrends. Now, and I talked about this, the connected world. We see a connection stepping up time and time again. It's in, it's in smarter cities. It's in, it's in the connecting of billions and billions of things, whether it's 40 billion or 300 billion, it's just rising and growing faster than we anticipate. And it creates unprecedented data volumes. But something also happened, and I think it's the focus on climate change and resource scarcity, particularly through the last couple of years. And I think one of the areas where we underestimated the growth of semiconductors is in this area. Because, you know, energy prices will go up, the demand for energy will go up, um, renewables be, will become more important. Uh, we have to focus on waste and uh, you know, pollution. But as I will show later, later on, there's some very good examples that semi semiconductors are going to make a big difference. And then, you know, um, also a very important trend, uh, we'll have more people. So focus on life sciences and medical and health is going to be paramount. Uh, the urbanization is also accelerating 
And you now the last two points. You know, I'm from a generation where actually we were given the promise of the global village. And I had a discussion with some young people that actually said, you guys screwed up, you know, your generation, because you left us with, with all these problems. I said, listen, but the, our generation did create a global village. You know, our generation, my generation did create the internet, did create global travel. I think this is, and it gave us an enormous push in economic development and in innovation. But that is deglobalizing, and I also uh, and I also see that. I think we were we're seeing socio-economic blocks that will lead to, let's say, geo geopolitical discussions, and the drive for technological sovereignty, which is going to be a very important driver for our business going forward. And we'll talk about that. So. This is just translating into applications, uh, connected world clouds, uh, artificial intelligence, AI, edge computing, uh, energy transition, energy transition and electrification. Now, energy transition was not on our radar screen. It's one of those applications, one of those many dots that are created in the semiconductor space that we didn't have a good vision on. Yeah? But it's happening as we speak. It's going to be a, a significant driver. And of course, then the social and the economic shifts, which is a different way of working, working, healthcare, and the sovereignty drive. Now, on top of that, we see this drive for, art, for artificial intelligence. And it's not only in our systems, in our networks, it's not only, not only in, in, let's say, the way that we compute, but it's also very much on device. So it's in the edge, it's in the cloud, it's in our networks, but it's also uh, in the individual device where, you know, whether it's automotive or whether it's the smartphone, whether it's the PC, whether it's drone technology, whether it, these are applications that, are, that you will find in health and in life sciences. And you will have these applications all needed, this type of innovation. The artificial intelligence, you know, drive is a big driver also for our industries. And, and I, I want to go into some detail on uh, what I said earlier. I think the energy transition is something that surprised us yeah, for the last couple of... And just anecdotal evidence, we had a Chinese customer that actually was in our offices at the, at the beginning of the year, and they said basically they were uh, um, making very mature uh, uh, you know, stuff. Yeah? Uh, it was in power, uh, in some uh, analog products. And I actually said, Peter, you know, we need your help because we're going to build a 300 millimeter fab, 90 nanometers, 9-0. Yeah? I said, why do you need, want to build a 300 millimeter fan for, for a 90 nanometer? I said, well, it's because of automotive power ICs, smart power ICs, and the energy transition. And he started to talk about, you know, the energy transition that they needed and the semiconductors they need to make for, for mobile, so, sorry, for wind and for solar. And he didn't even talk about the energy grid. And, and basically, this is some, some data that we uh, uh, got from some of our customers and uh, some of other companies. Uh, this one is from uh, you know, Shell. It's an estimate that you know, one megawatt of wind power will, will take 3,000 euros worth of semiconductors. And solar, 4,000. Now, the question. What was the electricity need in the world in 2019? It was about 24,000 terawatt hour. Now, you can then calculate this and take the average of wind and so on. So if all the electricity need in the world, which of course is not going to be the case, but it's going to be wind and solar, you come to significant numbers. Now, the 24,000 was 21,000 three years earlier. It was 2019, the 24,000. So now it's 2022, we're three years you know, later. That will accelerate because of the consumption of electricity. Now, if you then think about this, uh, if, if, if all the electricity would be wind and uh, solar, the massive amounts of semiconductors are actually needed. Now, of course, there will be a mix, but it just shows you that the things that we haven't thought of, and it's particularly in the area of what we call mature or mainstream or specialty semiconductors. It's in power, power IC, it's in analog, it's microcontrollers, it's, 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 it's sensors, optical sensors, non-optical sensors. And then we see it on the consumption side, and this is, this is data that uh, Infineon shared, also publicly said, you know, the expectation is by 2030, 70% of the cars will be somehow related to an electrical vehicle. Could be hybrid, could be, could be high hybrid, uh, low hybrid, could be full, full uh, you know, electric. 70% of 100 million cars, 70 million cars, you know, and it's more than $1,500 uh, per vehicle in this decade. Could be the end of the decade, 
But you do just just do the math, and this is this is without this is on top of that you have uh, uh, the 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 ADS that is the Advanced Driver Assisted Systems that take massive amounts of you know semiconductors. We'll come to that later. Yeah? So um, we actually see that back in in this is a uh, a. Um, uh, you know, slide that I that I borrowed for from a good friend Lars Rager, CTO of uh, NXP Semiconductors, and I saw this slide when he was presenting on the IMAC Future Technology Conference. And you know, uh, the 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 word word in you know Europe was when it came to semiconductors and automotive. Is, that's all 28 nanometer stuff and and older. Well, this is what Lars presented, and it's this is what this is. This is across the entire product portfolio. And it's basically, it's about sensors and actuators yeah, that actually pick up the analog data out of, from the sensors in, in the car. They basically compute this real time close to the sensor yeah, and then bring it into the communication system of the car so that it can be processed by the main uh, microprocessor, which is five uh, nanometer. Basically, it's what Oliver Zipser told me. He said, Peter, we are a system integrator. I mean, if you're a system integrator, you use the entire product portfolio. And this is also what we are seeing a bit later on, look at some data from TSMC. So automotive will be one of the most advanced users of uh, uh, semiconductors in this decade. Now, geopolitics. And I've said it before, I mean, uh, some people that know me know that what I'm going to say is 1973 revisited, the oil crisis. Oil was always there until it wasn't, and it was a strategic uh, commodity. It was a it, it was a strategic problem, um, and then suddenly we fast forward 2021 or, tw or, or you know 20, 2020, and semiconductors have always been there until they weren't, and we suddenly start to you know realize that there is a dependence, a dependency created uh, in those decades that countries and 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 geopolitical systems don't like. So we see this push for technological sovereignty. I think we've just seen the beginning. Because if you think about the growth rate of the industry, and you think about the geographical distribution of chip manufacturing, then if you want to create some level of technological sovereignty, and that doesn't need, mean that you need to do everything, you just need to stay relevant. Well, with that growth rate, staying relevant, it means that you need to invest, double up your investments uh, as, uh, as countries, to make sure that you can stay relevant. Yeah? And this is just the first phase. It, it will, there will be more coming. And having said that, do we need it? Well, that's, this is a question we sometimes get from politicians when I talk to politicians. I said, why would we do this? And why would we in, in, in Europe or in the US you know, have these chips act? Because the, 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 the profitability of the ecosystem, and this is a slide I always like to use, it's the 50 top technology companies in our ecosystem, which starts on the top with the equipment companies, and then we deliver our products to the chip makers and the chip makers to the uh, uh, smartphone and the hardware makers, which actually ends up in, uh, basically it's the, it's the, it's the uh, you know, cloud companies and it's the Microsofts and the Alphabets of this world. The EBIT in 2021, the combined EBIT of these 50 companies is $688 billion. Compact annual growth rate over the last six years of 19%. So, the industry has more than sufficient means to pay for this, this expansion. So, why then these, these uh, government incentive systems? Well, you know, at, at least we tell the politicians that asked that question said it is not about the fact that the industry cannot afford it. But the industry has a choice, has a choice to build their next manufacturing expansion wherever they want and wherever from their point of view it's the most efficient and, and the less risk. And that's where they currently have their ecosystem. So if you want to pick up and build an ecosystem, you're basically creating risk, risks for these companies. And that means these companies need to be incentivized, you could call it on the non-economical top of that risk. And this is why you need to step up if you want to have uh, within your geographical boundaries, you want to have advanced or, or mature semiconductor manufacturing, you'd better make sure that you uh, provide them an incentive to take away part of that top economical risk. Okay, so 
What does it mean? Do we have enough money? Yes, we do. And with that money and with that, that innovation power, which is not only money, it's also the intellectual power, the roadmap is still very much there. You know, when this is, we'll go into some detail, but both in advanced logic, in DRAM and in NAND, we have a very clear roadmap that extends to 2030 and in many cases beyond. And this is what we're discussing with our customers these days. Just to give you an example, this is um, on you know, logic. Actually, this is an IMAX slide, which uh, IMAX, as you know, does a lot of, a lot of pre-competitive work with the leaders in the industry. And this is the roadmap. It actually goes to 2036, and when you look at the metal pitch, it actually scales down to 16 to 12. You know, the half pitch, you, know, you can do the calculation, yeah? is, 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 low, is a single digit. Yeah? And that is the pitch. That's not what we would call the lithography, or let's say the semiconductor node. And the node is expressed in a different nanometer term. And even if you go, for instance, from FinFET to CFET, you know, from gate all around, uh, nanosheets to fork sheet to CFET, you basically talk about um, a sub one nanometer node, uh, as the nomenclature will be called, sub one nanometer. Um, and that is real. This is what the research is currently working on. It's also true for DRAM. Now, this is a slide for uh, Kinom Kim about a year ago, less than a you know, year, year ago. What you're seeing here is that the bit density will go up, and it also means that the design rules will keep shrinking, yeah? which actually means that the, that the, that, that the, the um, uh, gigabyte density per chip will go up significantly, almost exponentially. And this is a roadmap which has been discussed with our customers in detail. But this is not just a presentation on, a, on, on an open forum. This is how we and our customers work together to make sure that we understand the requirements. It's not only the technical requirements, but also the economical requirements of what they are doing. Yeah? And this is where this collaboration model that we have with our customers is so critically important and it's becoming even more important than ever before. It's also true for, for instance, other parts of the, of, of the industry, for instance, 3D NAND, it's the same thing. Now, if you take that all together and then you go and say, so what does that mean for our business? What does that mean for the size of the business of our customers that ultimately are going to come to us to ask for uh, you know, machines? Well, if you then look at the industry analysts and uh, the, the Tech Insights, or whether it's McKinsey or it is uh, Semi, their estimate of the uh, semiconductor industry anywhere between 1 to 1 1.3 trillion. Yeah? But how does that then, if then we take the data and we split it over seven segments, which is basically, you, know, you probably know this if you've uh, followed our capital markets day before. We look at the smartphone market, look at the personal compute market, consumer electronics, uh, wired and wireless infrastructure, and then the data centers and, and uh, servers, and then automotive, and then industrial. And I'll talk about the industrial a little bit later. But you can actually see that, that on the top row, uh, consumer, personal computing, smartphone, that's single-digit growth. Yeah? And it's data that uh, we use uh, from um, Research Institute till 2026, 2027, and we, do some extra, and, and we internally do some extrapolation also based on the discussion we have with, with our customers, based on the roadmaps that we just saw. And then you see that there are three areas where we see double-digit growth, and that is in the server and the data center domain. Remember the AI slide that I showed you. Yeah? It's very much about the cloud and the edge infrastructure yeah? that is going to drive this. And then automotive. Well, talked about the automotive market and the fact that the electrification is, is going to see a significant jump up. Yeah? in terms of the use of uh, semiconductors. If you look at the drivetrain, you know, um, an, an electric vehicle needs twice uh, the number of uh, semiconductors. And you don't talk about the advanced driver assisted systems. That's all about safety. Uh, and and uh, that will be on top. So if you look at that, there's significant double digit growth in the automotive market. And it's also what we are seeing today where the automotive market, as you know, there's still there are shortages in the automotive market because it goes so fast. And the last bucket is industrial electronics. Everything that we cannot put into these six uh, buckets go into bucket seven. 
And this is where we have these um, uh, examples of the energy transition, of uh, life sciences. Um, at the IMAC conference, for instance, um, we saw a presentation of a life science company that does DNA sequencing. I actually showed a chart that sequencing one DNA 25 years ago was $90 million. Now it's 600 with that new machine, and by the end of the decade, it will be less than 50. Yeah? So, um, but that machine generates 20 gigabyte of data per day. Yeah? So I think if you then think about, that's in that bucket. We just talked about the electrification, and we talked about um, the, the uh, energy transition, and what is needed there. And we, we talk about, every, about industrial uh, uh, you know, applications. Um, I think our artificial intelligence, you will find very clearly the biggest impact in industrial applications. Now, for what it's worth, it's double-digit growth. I think it's conservative for the simple reason that we don't know. We don't know. We simply cannot, can, cannot connect all the dots. And those dots are being created because the value of Moore's law is there. We're creating more value than we create cost with every new node. And then some intelligent company or a group of intelligent people is going to think of an, of, an, of an application that we currently don't know of, or that we cannot assess in terms of size and impact. It's, it's basically the question you've been asking me for 25 years, said, Peter, what's the next killer application? And I said, oh, same answer, I have no clue. And this is also what the CEO of one of our major customers told me when I said, why didn't you tell us you needed so much more mature tools? And he said, Peter, because we have no clue. And that's happening. Yeah? And that's happening throughout the industry. Why? Because we're continuously creating value. And in that bucket, that's where we'll probably see the biggest surprises. But this is what we take. This is what we currently know. And we take those growth rates and we then say, okay, what we at ASML taking all that data, taking those seven buckets, what do we think? We think if we add it all up, it's going to be about a CAGR of 9%. And it's, uh, well, pretty close to 1.1 trillion by 2030. This is how we look at the world, at the end markets, in combination with the discussion we have with customers on their roadmaps. Now, what does it do to waiver demand? Now, I'm going to take you back to last year. Because one of your questions must be, you know, last year you did the same tricks. You know, you, you went through it and you missed a, <laughs> a couple of things, and we did. Uh, one thing I, I told you, the impact of the energy transition, we didn't take into consideration the way we do it today. Yeah. So last year we actually said, when you look 2020 as the base, that by 2025, on advanced logic, we would probably add 130,000 wave starts per month per year. That's this 0.13 on the top row. And on DRAM, we say it's about 80,000. And on NAND, it's about 100,000. And on mature logic, where we were most wrong, it was 200,000. So we said, well, by 2025, probably the industry needs to support the growth of our customers, which was the previous slide. We need about 510,000 uh, wave starts, 505,000 wave starts. Yeah. Now we're a year later, and we have to adjust a couple of things. They're predominantly in the logic space. They're predominantly in the logic space, in, in advanced logic, yeah, and that's basically it's the it's the increase that we're currently seeing because we underestimate a couple of things. I'm going to go, to go into some detail later on. But for instance, the focus on energy efficient performance in high end semiconductors, yeah, and I'll talk about that later. But it actually leads to bigger die sizes. We were actually we're now having insights into what these die sizes are going to look like which is different than what we thought last year. But uh, the biggest um, uh, jump up was in mature logic. And this is actually where our biggest shortages are. Our sh you know, shortages are in KRF, are in I-Line, are in dry ARF. It's 15-year-old uh, technology. Uh, this is where, and, and why is that? Because everything I just talked about in terms of automotive, energy transition, is not about two nanometer chips. And this is about... 28, 45, 65, it's about analog to digital chips. It's about power ICs, very important, smart power ICs. Yeah? And then 
we have, we're talking about microcontrollers, uh, sensors, uh, optical and non-optical sensors. That's in that bucket. And this is where we did much more research and insight together with our customers. And this is where the biggest shortage is. Now, when you then look at, um, sorry, one back. When you then look at what that means uh, for 2030, 20, 20, uh, our compound annual growth rate in terms of uh, wafer demand is then going up to 6.5 percent, with the, with in absolute terms the biggest growth in the uh, in the mature market. Yeah. Um, so, and it's driven by, like I said earlier, uh, it's by energy efficient focus on uh, advanced semiconductors. And is the mature market basically connecting more dots than we had sight on? Um, and, that, and that's clear. And that's what we're seeing today also. I mean, also for this year, sorry, for 2023, next year, we have a significantly higher demand on our KRF and I-line and dry ARF output than we can, than, than we can make. So there's a significantly higher you know, demand. So what are the changes then? I want to go into a bit of detail there. Um, and I want to start with the CMD of last year, where basically we said we need, for, for 2020 to 2025, we need 505,000 waiver starts per month uh, additional capacity per, per year. Um, and of that 505, I think we were wrong on the advanced market simply because of market-driven growth, which is the server, server market, um, uh, AR, VR market, uh, which is basically a bigger market than we anticipated, which accounts for about 45,000 wave starts increase. And the mature market, we were mostly wrong, which is basically industrial and automotive, um, which actually um, is, 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 and you can say again, industrial, what is that? That is this wide array of applications where we simply have not understood the demand of uh, the market. 180,000 waiver starts is our calculation. So market-driven growth altogether is about 225,000 waiver starts additional from 2020 to 2030 in terms of waiver start per month, per year. Then there's a technology-driven growth, which is another 50,000 waiver starts. And that has to do with the larger die sizes that I talked about. I'll give you an example a bit later. Now, the advanced market is growing faster. And I think you clearly see it in the server, in the server market, which is Gartner data and the uh, VR market. But I think more importantly is probably what TSMC showed. And actually when you look at the, at the smartphone and consumer market and you look at uh, these little blocks on the left hand side and you say, for instance, sensors. Yeah? Sensors are actually uh, moving from 0.35 micron now up to 28 nanometer. And more bands and higher speed in smartphones and in the, on, on the consumer side, also moves up from um, uh, basically uh, you know, and, and uh, 65 nanometer to 6 nanometer, which is very clearly EUV territory. And the same is true for sound and image. So basically what you are seeing is in those products, smartphone and consumer, there is a significant increase in technology innovations that need next nodes. And that's a driver that we now have better insights in, and that means that there is a higher demand for, ad, for advanced semiconductors. And the mature market, the mature market that I talked about this is, um, is, is a market that's very difficult to understand because it's so wide. And um, the, 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 the energy transition, I talked about solar, talked about wind, I didn't talk about the grid about the energy grid. The energy grid needs to be upgraded. It needs to be upgraded with microcontrollers, with sensors. So basically, because when you generate the electrons, you need to offload it to the grid. That's going to be a significant area where um, mature semiconductors are going to be used. But also on the consumer market, there's also a TSMC slide. And when you later on look into the detail, you see that in all these areas, you see that the, the um, number of mature chips used in those applications are sometimes 20 folds higher in terms of units. Yeah? And it all, this is to do with, this, with the smart cars. Yeah? And, and when you look at the automotive and then look at the increase in, 
in a low-end chips or mature chips that are used in a car, and you look at those four blocks, you can see that it's 10 to 20-fold increases of just mature semiconductors, just for smart cars. And this is all data points, but what do we see? I think this is an important slide. What we actually see is the mask sets that are being run through our you know, systems, anything above 28 nanometer. 28, you can see it here, it's uh, 40, 65, and 90 to 130 nanometer, to 0.13 micron. Yeah, and you can see the technology that is needed for it, which is in these green blocks. And you've seen that over the last couple of years, we've seen a 40% increase in the number of mask sets. And every mask set is a product. So you see that instead of, you can see in, in 2012, the dark blue line, which is 90 to, to 0.13 micron, actually went down. But from 2015 onwards, you see a significant growth. And this is what we're continuously seeing. And this, by the way, is also being confirmed by some of the mask makers. There's an EB mask maker initiative that actually, over a somewhat shorter period, saw an increase of 48%. So actually, we are, and that was in this uh, mature market node area. And this is a clear proof that there are products being designed and being fed through the manufacturing system that we have no clue of. And we could, of course, seen this, but we didn't. And we didn't understand it. But it's happening. It's there. Now, energy efficiency. I think uh, what we would like to do, <laughs> the point is, if you want to make the, the leading edge device more energy efficient, you, you like to lower the, the uh, uh, you know, clock speed. You, you basically like to, like to run them at a lower voltage. But if you do that, the performance goes down. So how do you then level up to the performance? You include, you include more transistors. Well, if you have more transistors, you need more service area, which I think is, 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 is very well depicted by this, by this black part of the slide, which is basically a slide from Apple. And if you, it's probably difficult to read, but if you look at the left-hand side, you see the M1 chip. M1 chip basically has a high performance and low energy usage. But then if you look at the size of those chips and look at the right-hand side, the M1 chip is by far the biggest. So yes, you increase performance, you reduce energy usage, but there's one penalty, and the penalty is size. So you need to have bigger die, and to get the same units out, you need more wafers. And that's what we're seeing. So if you add it all up, this is again the slide 780,000 wave starts per month per year. On top of that, there's a technological sovereignty and the foundry competition as a result of it, because you will see that multiple companies or more companies are now going into the foundry market in the leading edge, and they were going to distribute across the globe. That will lead to some level of efficiency, inefficiency. And we assume that if you build across the industry 10% inefficiency, on the install base, on the install base, then you need about 150,000 wave starts uh, additional, just to create 10% inefficiency, which is depicted on this slide. Yeah. So to get to an installed wafer capacity, whereby we're able to deal with inefficiency as a result of the geopolitical situation, we need 10% more wafers. And that's a 930,000 wafer starts per month per year increase. Can they afford it? I think, yes, they can. That's an earlier slide. But also, these are the announced CapEx plans. If you just add up for our three largest customers and see where it happens across the globe, then it's, this is $330 billion yeah, of announced FAPs. I'm not spilling the beans. I mean, this is just public information. Yeah. That's the global capacity. So it's happening, and it's happening in different parts of the world, as you can see. And that could be a driver, very likely it's going to be a driver from some level of inefficiency. Now, if you believe that 10% inefficiency is too high, you take 5%, uh, which basically you divide uh, uh, you know, 10 by 5, and you know that you, or, or by 2, and then you know what about the, 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 the wafer capacity additions will be um, if you want to take another number. But it's going to add to the wafer capacity that is needed in the industry. Inefficiency is unavoidable. So, we need to expand capacity. 
I think if we want to grow, we need to expand capacity. And this is just, we all need to realize that we see this very st strong long-term growth. We have to add capacity, which is going to be step functions, like we're going from 375 DPV to 600. Uh, we have to prepare for cyclicality because we don't predict cycles. Cycles happen because of all kinds of reasons. Mm -hmm. And of course, we don't want to balance the interest of our stakeholders, which of, co of course includes very close contact with our customers, with our suppliers, with our investors, and with our people, and with society. So how do we do that? Well, there's two ways to, to add wafer uh, capacity, but just selling more machines. And if you compare uh, the 600 systems per year with the year 2020, yeah, you see a 2.5x two two, 2 increase in DPUV and a 3x increase in EUV. So that's basically compared with the output 2020. On top of that, we see productivity increase. With DPUV, we think we can have on average a 20% productivity increase and with EUV a 70% productivity increase, which actually gives you a wafer capacity increase uh, in DPUV of about 3x and low in A about 5, 5x. And high in A is the first of a kind of a new generation. Uh, we need those um, 20 systems or more than 20 systems in the time frame 2027, 2028. We need to do this. So we're going to expand 65,000 square meters of uh, manufacturing space, uh, which will lead probably to an average capex investment of half a billion per year, um, which by over five years translate to about 200 million euros of depreciation. Uh, you could say, if we're all wrong and we've all been dreaming and this growth will not happen, then we will be stuck with uh, 200 million of depreciation because of this expansion. Um, I think that's bearable. I think it's also bearable in the supply chain, which we think need to invest about 2 billion. But for them, of course, the math is about the same. Now, to um, uh, close off. As again, I hope I was clear on how we see the global trends that fuel uh, semiconductor growth. It's across the entire space. It's in advanced, it's in mature, it's in memory, it's in logic. And that means that we believe that our customers' market could grow around 9% compound annual growth uh, from 2020 to 2030, which needs about 6.5% CAGR growth of the wafers, which in order to be able to ship those machines, we need to up our capacity in DPV from 365 to 600 and to 90 EUV systems and at least 20 high NA systems. Okay, that was my part of the presentation. Um, I talked about us, you know, we should do it, but I know the question will also be, what about your suppliers? And of course, Zeiss is our biggest uh, supplier, our biggest partner. And uh, we've asked uh, Andreas Pecher, the CEO of Zeiss SMT and part of an, and a board member of the uh, you know, Zeiss holding company uh, to just address us and to give us his view on one, what is Zeiss doing? And two, how committed are they? Thank you.
the semiconductor industry is highly innovative and dynamic, and so are we. In all of the Zeiss Semiconductor businesses, our technology roadmap supports the industry's growth and relentless innovation. These businesses comprise our mask solutions, process control solutions, and at last but not least, our optical systems for semiconductor manufacturing. 2022 marks the 25th year of the strategic partnership of ASML and Zeiss, and we have been working together since about 40 years. After all these years, our companies together are tackling the challenges, especially in demanding times like today. Looking at the growth of, for example, our headquarter in Oberkochen, Germany, one can already tell our success story. Starting with a few buildings on literally a green field, our current factory evolved. We are now further growing our capacities and ramping up with new buildings, machines, as well as staff. Additional to our headquarters, we are also ramping up in all our German and international locations. The market demands this growth from us, and we work very closely with ASML and other customers to align our roadmaps on technology and capacity. Our aspiration is not only to be the technology leader, but also the growth leader, all this to support our customers. We need to ramp up in all dimensions, our infrastructure, our equipment, and our supply chain. But we also need more educated and qualified employees, and we act fast on this. The development of our complex products takes time. For example, years from start of design to volume manufacturing looking at high NA, but also when it comes to deep UV. Speed is important, but at our extreme requirements, mirror precision in the picometer range and integration of highly complex mechatronic systems, it takes significant time and requires top talent from various technical competencies. It's our mission to keep the development lead times at an absolute minimum, and so we are ramping our R&D team as quickly as we can. Let me give you some insights on three of our dimensions. Strengthening our DPV lithography solutions is of critical importance to us, both by expanding our production capacities and, together with ASML, further improving our DPV products. Together with ASML, we are the sole providers of EOV lithography systems. We feel it is our responsibility to the industry and to the overall market to provide the required solutions at the required capacities as quickly as possible because only with these products, semiconductor manufacturing at the leading edge with highest productivity is possible. With high NA, we will drive Moore's law to the next level. The challenges with high NA EUV mirrors are significantly larger and of higher complexity than conventional EUV mirrors. More complex manufacturing processes must be mastered. To tackle these challenges and to bring this new technology to market, the teams are working at full speed. Our strategic partnership with ASML has a strong foundation. We are confident in facing the challenges together and to meet the market's demands. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we just saw the market opportunity. We just saw all the effort that is being put into this, both by ourselves, but also by uh, bite size. So now indeed, let's look at what is this going to generate? What is going to generate for us? How are we going to serve our customers? And ultimately, how is that going to, uh, how is that going to result in, uh, in, uh, in the numbers that uh, Peter already referred to, which of course is an important topic of conversation today. Before I do that, just a couple of things that uh, that we're gonna that we're gonna review before actually going into the euro number. So first off, I think it's important to just look backwards just a little bit in terms of you know what are the investments that we've made, uh, how does that reflect in the in the historic performance of the of the company. Then I'm going to talk about our model. So how is the model? How do we uh, how do we make these different models in terms of you know potential scenarios for for 2025 and for 2030? How do we do that? What's the, what's the methodology behind that? And then I'm going to uh, borrow some of the work that uh, that Peter has shown in terms of how do we look at the markets, how do we look at the different uh, at the different um, uh, technologies, how how is the build up there, et cetera, et cetera, in order to ultimately get you to what does this mean for the different technologies that we have for DPV, for EV, low NA, and and high NA for metrology and inspection, and how does it ultimately reflect in uh, in our uh, PNL? 
And then finally, what are we going to do with the money? Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the money that is being generated, how is that going to find its way back into the, uh, into the business? Uh, and, what, uh, what, uh, and in what fashion will it be distributed to, uh, to shareholders? Uh, and then, obviously, we're also going to talk about the new share buyback program uh, that we intend to start today. So with that, uh, let's uh, let's go back in uh, in time a little bit uh, and very very briefly. This is uh, this is the investments that we've made within uh, ASML in the, the past couple of years, starting in in 2010. And what you see here is three type of investments, if you want to call it that. Obviously, the R and D expenditure uh, that that we have, which is the dark blue uh, element of the of the bars. Then we have the capex, and uh, you know a lot of the capex uh, you you would have seen if you uh, if you uh, you know if you uh, if you um, uh, are here. At, at our premises, a lot of new buildings in comparison to last time that we were able to see each other here in uh, in 2018 in in person, and also you know quite a few cranes that are an indication for the capex that is uh, is underway. And then of course we did a number of acquisitions, acquisitions that uh, that are strategic that we believe were strategic in order to accomplish the execution of our roadmap. The latest one of that being the acquisition of Berliner Glass, now ASML Berlin, in 2020. So all of those investments and the execution of that of that roadmap, uh, I think they've they've generated some pretty good results for the for the company. Uh, and all in all, if you go back again to 2010, uh, you would see a CAGR uh, around our EPS, around our, our earnings per per share of 18%, driven by obviously growth, one of the key themes obviously of of today, growth in our revenue. And you see revenue grow from 4.5 billion in 2010 to you know around 21 billion uh, expected for this uh, for this year you see an increase in our gross margin starting at uh, 43% at at uh, at the uh, at 2010 again, going to 50% and up for uh, for you know for last year and uh, and this year um, and of course, uh, also with the share buybacks, share buybacks that accounted for, I would say, about two percent out of the eighteen percent in terms of the uh, in terms of the CAGR. So I think all in all, I think the roadmap execution that we've uh, that we've embarked on, I think, has uh, has clearly uh, you know result uh, has clearly uh, produced results also financially for the uh, for the company. And that's not going to notice in the financial markets either. So if you look at the development of the uh, of the shareholder value for ASML over this period, 2010 to 2022, it's been a very substantial generation of um, uh, of shareholder value. A 24% CAGR uh, in terms of the uh, total shareholder return, which is you know north of uh, what the semiconductor index, which the SOX index uh, did, and also uh, substantially north of where the NASDAQ uh, was. Um, you know, some of you thought that uh, the development of this curve was a little bit boring. You know, the only way is up. Obviously, this year created some uh, some uh, some uh, some interesting dynamics in there, as you can see. Uh, obviously, uh, as, as we've all as we've all witnessed. But you know, we stopped uh, c calculating this by November first. Obviously, the past couple of days and past couple of weeks have been uh, have been pretty helpful again. But it's pretty clear the volatility that is uh, that is there. No matter what it is, uh, I think it's pretty it's pretty plain to see that the uh, the performance of the company and the good results that the company has generated have also been reflected in the return to uh, to our shareholders but all of that is history and i think the question obviously is you know based on this and based on all the investments that have been made but also the investments that we're embarking on what does that mean for continued uh, for continued growth and again, just to remind everyone how we do this, and the methodology has not changed. So the methodology that we that we use in order to come up with these different uh, different scenarios for 2025 and 2030, that you know that methodology is unchanged in comparison to what we did last year, and also unchanged in comparison to what we did in 2018 and the uh, and the capital market days uh, before. Starting point is the end markets, as, as Peter just demonstrated. You know, segmented into the, the seven different uh, different uh, uh, seven different segments. We then translate those end markets into the wafer uh, into wafer demand for all of those uh, segments, and then wafer demand obviously spread for different nodes, right? So you know the different nodes in logic, in in uh, mature and advanced, different nodes for uh, for DRAM, for uh, for NAND. And then we translate that in a very transparent way for you into the into the litho spend, where we give you the litho spend for the, for those different uh, nodes, and that's the way how we come up with um, you know with the different with the demand in terms of number of uh, number of tools. Obviously, recognizing the improvement in productivity that you've seen uh, and that we expect to see in these in these tools. And then, in addition to that, obviously, we have the installed base business. 
which is growing with the installed base, both you know based on service and based on upgrades, and that then gets us to different scenarios: a low uh, a low market scenario and a high market scenario, both for 25 and for 2030. For 2030, that is new because you will recall that in uh, that in the last Capital Markets Day, we only gave you a CAGR uh, for uh, for 2030. We now believed it was appropriate, also you know given the better insights that we have, including better insights on what the technology uh, sovereignty. Was what that, uh, what that really does, we were able to now also give you scenarios uh, for, uh, for that year as, as well. So that's the methodology. I will skip through this because, in essence, these slides have been shared by, uh, by Peter, but they are important just to follow the logic of the, uh, of the, uh, of the model that we have. So here you see the dev developments in the end markets. Here you see the translation uh, of that into, um, into the wafer capacity, uh, the wafer starts per month, per year, uh, as, uh, as, as Peter just uh, laid, that, laid that out, adding up to the 930, including the 150 from the tech sovereignty and the, uh, and the, the foundry uh, competition. Um, and then uh, here you have the buildup of, um, of the technology, if you like, for the different nodes. This is unchanged in comparison to last year, right? So the, the composition uh, per node in terms of, you know, what do we think is going to be done by high NA, what's going to be done by 0.33 low NA, what's being done by immersion, et cetera, et cetera. That composition has not changed for these. The only thing we did is also in light of the fact that we now have these scenarios for 2030, we added a few nodes on the memory side, so both for DRAM and for, for NAND. But the, the composition and also the node-on-node -node growth at as it is being projected here uh, as a as a CAGR for this uh, for this period, the 30% over 20% and over 10% respectively is unchanged. And here we also, in light of the importance of the uh, of the maturity of the mature market, and in light of the uh, in light of the growth that we anticipate there, we also thought it was appropriate to give you some insight into the uh, composition uh, of the of the different nodes in on the mature side. And here you see that you know for some, you know uh, the the one you see here for 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 mature logic analog and also on sensors, the 45 nanometer and also 40 nanometer. You see that for instance there is also immersion. Or ROI uh, nodes are in there, and actually they're a pretty substantial part of the, of the total cost of lithography for those particular nodes. So with that, so with those building blocks, and again, the, the majority of the building blocks, uh, Peter has spent a lot of time explaining those, those building blocks. What does that generate? So how does that translate into, into results for the, for the company? And let's start with the install to install base uh, business. Install base in 2020 started at, um, at 3.7 billion. That was the starting point that we used in the capital markets day of last year. So that block, that, that dark blue uh, block there uh, or bar is the 3.7 billion. And by 2025, we expected in the capital markets a, a midpoint for that of six and a half billion. Uh, but of course, you also realize that this year we're already approaching 5.7 billion for the installed base business. That's the expectation. So I think it is fair to assume, you know, growing it from 3.7 to 5.7 in essence in, in, in two years' time, I think it's fair to assume that the midpoint of 6.5 billion that we have by 2025 is probably too conservative. On the back of, you know, an, a, a growth in the installed, uh, installed base and also on the back of our success, I would say, in providing upgrades, we thought it was appropriate. To have that to have that midpoint uh, grow to seven point uh, to seven point five billion. So here you see that there is this uh, growth, um, and as a result of that, you see the CAGR that we expected from you know twenty twenty to twenty twenty five in the capital markets day of last year, a CAGR of twelve percent for that for that five year period. We now expect that CAGR to be uh, to be fifteen percent at the midpoint. Again, growing from three point seven in twenty twenty now to uh, now to seven and a half billion by uh, by twenty twenty five. Um, and then uh, the CAGR uh, beyond that point, so the, the CAGR for the installed base business uh, starting in 2025 all the way to 2030, we expect that to be uh, at the same level, so at 10%, but obviously off a higher base, and as a result of that, obviously, you know, more, uh, more growth. So that's the expectation that we have there. So what it ends up doing in terms of CAGR for the entire period, for the entire decade, is that it would take the, uh, the CAGR of 11% for the installed base business that we discussed with you last time. We expect that to go to 30%. In terms of systems, what, is the, what are the expectations for systems? And what we, uh, what we present to you here, uh, primarily for advanced logic for DRAM and for NAND, 
A lot of it is actually consistent with what we had last year, uh, which tells you that you know a lot the lion's share of the uh, of the improvement in the numbers really comes from the increase, if you like, in in end market demand. But there are a, a few uh, changes here, and those changes are uh, are uh, in the bold in the bold lettering in the in the boxes. So what are the key assumptions? First key assumption in terms of market share, that does not change. So market share for EUV, obviously 100%. For immersion, 90%. For the dry business, 65%. Those were the same market share uh, assumptions that we, uh, that we discussed last, uh, last year. If we look at advanced logic, uh, and we look at the reference point, the reference point of 16 to 14 nanometer, that was 315 uh, last year. We took that up to 350 uh, for now, because you know, it's clear that you know, our customers keep on adding also in those nodes, because there is still uh, a demand in those, uh, in those nodes. So you really see nodes becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. So the 14 to 16 uh, nanometer node now is estimated at, uh, at 350 as the starting, as the starting point. In terms, of, um, in terms of the low and the high scenario, uh, in terms of the node and node change, so every node after the, the 1640 nanometer, what happens there? Uh, last, uh, last year, in 2021, we talked in the low scenario about minus 15, uh, and we really think on the back of what Peter showed, you know, in, in, in terms of the increase uh, in, uh, in end market uh, demands and the increase in, in, in wafer start capacity that is, uh, that is needed, we took that uh, down to minus 15. Percent. So node, on, uh, node over node minus five percent. Still negative in the in the low scenario, reflecting that obviously you get more bits uh, with every uh, with every new node. But you know, uh, taking that back from minus fifteen to minus five. In the high scenario, we had it at zero uh, in the capital markets day of last year. We now put it at eight percent plus um, uh, in, in, uh, for advanced logic. Again, reflecting the very significant demand that is uh, that is clearly there as it relates to the to the advanced nodes in the high scenario. In terms of EUV exposures, uh, in essence, no real change. So that is un that is uh, that is unchanged in comparison to what we had last year. In terms of DRAM, more or less the same. Uh, the, the, uh, also, the bit growth has not, uh, you know, in the in the in, in the term that we're looking at here, 2025, 20, 2030, 20, uh, that has not changed. So bit growth low, 15%, high, 25%. The only thing we changed here is the assumption on wafer capacity conversion that was at 70 uh, that was at 60 to 70% in 2021 we took that to 70 to 80% uh, for for this uh, for this time and the background really is what we see our customers do so we really see that our customers are you know making those technology transitions it is affordable for them to go to to a new technology transition you know to to have more uh, to have more euv for instance deployed in there so we really see them uh, see more and more capacity being turned onto onto the new uh, technology. And there we have nine exposures, used to be eight, uh, but of course those nine exposures would also include now in this, in this model high NA exposures, one to, uh, one to two. As it relates to NAND, no real changes in the assumption. The only change there is that we actually took the high, uh, the high down. Uh, we took it down from 45% to 35%. And the reason there is that we do see, you know, that the uh, the, the transition, uh, the, the transition technology transition is a bit slower. And as a result of that, we think that the affordability uh, of that, you know, becomes a little bit compromised. And as a result of that, we took that back from 45 to 35%. So these are the main uh, assumptions in the in the model as it relates to the system sales. So what does that all translate, uh, translate into uh, for, the, uh, for, the different, uh, for the different technologies and, and, and for the different system units that we have? So if we look at the screen here, there's a few conclusions that you can draw, uh, from, uh, that, you can draw from that. As you see on high NA for 2025, we didn't change anything. And the reason we didn't change is it's consistent with what we discussed last year. Of course, there will be more shipments in 2025 than the five that we have here. But given the complexity of the delivery model be behind uh, high NA, and given the uncertainties that we have on revenue, Revenue recognition. When exactly is the point that all of it is there, that all of it has been tested, and that in fact you can say that the system has met all the obligations that we have vis-a-vis -vis the customer? We took a pretty conservative stance and only have five systems in here that we recognize as revenue, and that assumption has not has not changed. 
Then if you go down, you see a big jump in the, in the dry business. So both in the high scenario and the low scenario, you see that there is a big jump in the dry business. And of course, that is very much a reflection of what Peter has been talking about, about the, uh, the mature technology and the, and the huge increase in demand that we simply did not foresee to this extent last, year, last time that we discussed that. So hence the, uh, the big jump there. You also see quite a jump on the, uh, on the emergent technology. And emergent technology really benefits from two developments. Of course, on the one hand, uh, on, the, uh, on the advanced logic side, immersion there is, a, is, a, is an important player, right? So the fact that you saw this, uh, this significant increase on the back of, uh, uh, of artificial intelligence, automotive, and what have you, for the demand for advanced logic, of, obviously that is reflected in the, uh, in, in, in the emergent sales. But I also showed you that in a number of mature nodes, the 40 nanometer, 45 nanometer, uh, you actually saw there as well that immersion plays a significant role. Right, so immersion actually benefits from from the from those two from those two uh, developments, and there you see that go up. You also see EUV go up, and on EUV you, see, you actually see see two things. On the one hand, you you see it going up uh, from 70 to 80 in the in the high market scenario. Again, I suppose not a surprise because this benefits from a bunch of things. This benefits from the development on the uh, on the advanced logic side that we just talked about. This obviously also benefits from the tech sovereignty and the competition in the foundry business. So there, it's clear that uh, that, that that benefits uh, from uh, from those uh, developments. You also see that the variability in EUV goes down, right? So if you look at the delta between the high scenario and the low scenario, where you had a gap of 22, right? 70 minus 48 for uh, 4.33. Uh, you had that in the capital markets of last year. That is actually shrinking. And the reason it is, is that it's becoming clear that EUV is you know, quite resilient also in less favorable market circumstance. So that's why the gap there actually increased, uh, uh, decreased if, from last year to uh, to today, uh, uh, on a actually on a higher base. Um, so that's the that's the 2025 uh, system uh, system developments as as you see it. And if you then look into what that does uh, in terms of uh, sales, it actually means that the. Uh, the high market scenario that we had uh, last year in the capital markets day has now actually become, uh, you know, the, the low market scenario at uh, at thirty at thirty billion, uh, and then you see that we've now modeled a high market scenario there at forty billion, which is a reflection of the unit numbers, obviously, that you see there on the left-hand side, the metrology and inspection uh, units that get added to that, and obviously the installed base business that I talked about in my previous slide. So then fast forward to 2030. Uh, so what's the expectation for, for 2030? And if you look at that, then uh, actually what you see is, of course, there is a very big increase here on the basis of high NA. Uh, again, high NA uh, for being a very significant enabler of, the, of our customers' roadmaps in the second half of this, uh, of this decade. And there you see high NA in the high market scenario at a level of, uh, of 30 billion. And as you know, uh, for high NA already today with, uh, with the tools that we're selling today, the north of 350 million. So it's obvious that that is a very significant driver of the top line by, 20, uh, by 2030. You see low and A sort of at the same, uh, at the same level, both in the high uh, scenario and in the, in the low scenario. And you actually also see that there is a, you know, still a, a, a bit of a dry and an immersion, so a bit of a deep UV that gets, uh, that gets added uh, to, uh, you know, to the capacity in the second half of this, uh, of this decade. So those are the main changes from 2025 to 2030. Again, please bear in mind that the tools that we're going to sell in 2030 are different tools from the tools that we're going to sell in 2025. So obviously, the productivity and all the specs of the 2030 tools are at a higher level. And of course, that should also translate into a better uh, ASP for those tools in 2030 in comparison to 2025. And if you take the unit increase and the ASP increase into consideration. And of course, you take into consideration the fact that you know, the install base continues to grow both for the service business and, for, uh, and for, the, for the upgrade business. Then you get to what you see here on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, the, uh, the total sales opportunity that you could model on the, back of these, uh, on the back of these scenarios. And that gets you to the 44 to 60 billion uh, euro opportunity uh, that, uh, that we see for, for ASML at that, at, that, at that time frame. So if you try to analyze it, so where does it all come from? Uh, first off, the, uh, the quick analysis from 2025 um, uh, last year to 2025 this year. This is another cut at it. Uh, you see that uh, you know, the jump 
at midpoint 27 billion that we had in the scenarios of, uh, of last year to the midpoint uh, uh, that we have for the scenarios this year. You bridge 27 to 35. You see 4 billion coming out of that from, uh, from, from, uh, from EUV. And that's units in, in particular. Uh, you see uh, non-EUV accounting for, uh, for 3 billion. And you see the installed base businesses that are referred to uh, jumping from 6.5 to 7.5 billion. And that gives you a 1 billion a delta there. So that's the way to, uh, to, to come from the midpoint of last year to the midpoint of this year. If you then go to the 2030 project projection, so how do you get from the midpoint 35 uh, for 25 to the, uh, to the midpoint 52 in uh, 2030? EUV is a very significant driver of that in, in 10 billion. Of course, the lion's share of that, that's pretty obvious, is the, is the number of high NA tools, right? That, that's, the, that's the key driver there. But there's also an ASP increase, because as I mentioned to you earlier on, of course, the EUV tools that we're going to sell by 2030 have higher productivity, better overlay, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. As a result of that, more value to our customers, and as a result, result of that, will command higher uh, ASPs than the tools that we're going to sell by 2025. Non-EUV business uh, is gonna is gonna chip in three billion. As you saw, there is a unit uh, unit number increase there as as well. But also there, you will see our continued the continued dividends, if you like, of the uh, of the roadmap where we do produce tools, you know, that have higher performance as a result of that higher value to the customer and higher ASPs. And the installed base uh, business uh, at the midpoint uh, gaining four billion from 25 to 2030. So this is the way it's built up. If you then look at the look at the that, that we have there, you actually see that the CAGR for 2020 to 2025 grows from 14% to, uh, to 20%. And then you see that the CAGR from 25 to 2030, we keep at 8%. But again, we keep it at 8%, but off a significantly higher base by 2025. Very often we get a question, so, you know, what does that mean for litho intensity? And that's a, that's a term that is being used, albeit in, in very, different, very different ways. As you know, ASML is not a fan of WFV because we think it's a lagging indicator. But what we would want to present to you is how do we, how do we, how do we see the litho sales in comparison to the, to the semi-sales? So that's the percentage that you see here. It's an interesting journey as you, as you look at it historically, uh, and, and the people that have been in, the, in this industry for a while, they will probably recognize a few things. They will probably remember when you know, the market was very, very tough on the, uh, on the, litho, uh, on the litho builders in 2009 of the, uh, of the, of the financial crisis where you know, uh, the, the sales, level, sales levels really plummeted in that, uh, in that period of time. But then obviously that also, you know, going up very, very quickly as soon as people started to realize, hang on, we've been uh, too stringent here. There is a need for capacity, so new stuff needs to be, uh, needs to be added. And then you see the period of, uh, of multi-patterning. You see the period of uh, the conversion of 2D NAND to 3D NAND, so that's the period that you have here. And here you see the period, in, in fact, of EUV, right, where, where EUV, you know, stepped in uh, and EUV really, you know, led to a situation where, uh, if, uh, you know, where, where, where multi-patterning was, was being replaced by, uh, by single-patterning uh, EUV. And as a result of that, you see the litho sales as a percentage of semi-sales uh, go up. So you see that at the lowest end of our, uh, of our estimates, you see that that's sort of more or less neutral. So, so I would say more or less a, a, a neutral or steady uh, development from where that percentage is, is today. Uh, and that's where some analysts, uh, that's the way some, uh, some analysts are looking at it. You know, that's the, uh, that's the gray line that, uh, that, we, that we reference as external, uh, uh, external sources. You know, possible, but we think there are quite some, uh, quite some reasons why we believe there is potential over that and why we believe there is, uh, there is potential to, to get to, uh, to a continued increase of that, uh, of that line. And you see those on the left-hand side of the, uh, of the slide. First off, you know, this market is clearly growing, the semi-market is clearly growing, and obviously you need to have your capacity in before the market growth, right? So you have that acceleration, if you like, of the, uh, of, of the capacity that needs to be added before it actually, uh, you know, returns, uh, re returns uh, semi-sales. So, so that, that element of, of acceleration, CapEx needs to be there before you can actually uh, turn out the, uh, the, 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 uh, the semi-sales. Of course, that's one reason why we think there is reason for this, for a continuation of that upward, uh, upward trend. The second element we truly believe, and, and I think that is recognized by, by many analysts, that the equipment portion within the overall capex is going to increase. 
And with Hine, we believe, you know, within that envelope of, of equipment, uh, equipment sales, we believe there is, you know, reason to believe and reason for positive momentum also for the, uh, for the litho business. So for that to, to, to be a higher percentage on a, uh, on a go, go forward basis, that would be a second reason for, to expect that increase. And then thirdly, the tech sovereignty trend leads to your lower utilization. So that in and by itself is also a good reason to assume that there will be a continued move upwards of the, of the litho sales in comparison to the, to the semi sales. So how is all of that going to reflect? So we just looked at the, at the top line. So how is all of that going to reflect into our overall uh, financial, uh, financial model? Well, this is what we presented to you last time. So let's, uh, let's focus on the deltas for, for 2025. Of course, we did talk about the, the top line. So I won't spend too much time on that. You see that the gross margin we've kept flat in comparison to last year. Some of you might say, well, wait a minute. If, if, you, if you increase your top line, shouldn't you expect a higher uh, gross margin? But remember that the mix effect of having more dry business in there as having a detrimental effect. So, so you know, on the one hand, of course, with a top line uh, increase, you would expect uh, an increase in the gross margin. But the mix effect of having more dry business in there probably takes it down uh, a bit. So that's why we keep that at a 50 to 56 percent uh, level. You see R&D here uh, at, the, uh, at the midpoint, at both midpoints, midpoint R&D divided by midpoint of sales at around 13 percent, which is a number that, uh, that you've probably seen uh, before. You see SGNA at, uh, at 3.7 percent uh, of, that, of that top line at the, at the midpoint, which is consistent with where we, had it, uh, where we had it last year. And then you see CapEx going up. This is the number that, uh, that Peter shared with you. So we expect every year to have about 500 million uh, increase in, uh, in CapEx. So that's the one you see there. And then you also see the effective tax rate going up a little bit as a result of some of the global tax debates that are going on. In terms of 2030, we talked about the, uh, the top line. We do believe in 2030 that there is potential to further, uh, further increase the value of our tools to customers. And as a result of that, also further increase our, uh, our gross margin. And we believe the bandwidth there to look at would be in the 56 to 60 percent uh, range. And, uh, you know, why is that? You know, it's, it's because at that stage, we believe we've taken high NA uh, to such maturity that it, that it will generate the, uh, the gross margin that we think uh, high NA has potentially there. And as we also mentioned, also for, for EUV in particular, we do believe there is, you know, the potential to further drive the value of those tools for the customer. So that's why we think a 56 to 60 percent potential for gross margin would be there in that, uh, in that time frame. R&D, midpoint, midpoint, around 12. 12% uh, uh, SGNA, you know, at a certain point in time, you will get some leverage from, uh, from there. So we think we can take that to 3% by 2030, away from the 4% that we had in 2021. And then you see the rest of the numbers there essentially unchanged in comparison to 2025. Good question, indeed. A good question. You know, what about the uncertainties that 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 we're in today? Because, of course, as, as Peter already mentioned it in his uh, in his in his introduction, it is interesting to uh, to talk about growth, but we shouldn't you know we shouldn't forget that we're talking about you know significant growth opportunities, medium term, longer term for ASML. But we should also recognize that the global economy is pretty unstable at this at this stage. So, very good questions from some of you. Uh, indeed, is you know how do you deal with the flexibility around that. So if for whatever reason that growth doesn't manifest itself, the capacity that you've built ha you know, is, is not being fully utilized, what does it do to you and what are the mechanisms that you have? You know, what are the risks? Well, you know, look at the forward statement that gives you all the risks that, that are out there. I advise you to take a good bottle of wine with you to be, before you read it. Uh, to, but, um, you know, if, if, you, uh, if, if you digest that, then, uh, then you see all the risks. But in essence, if you think about it, of course, it's geopolitics. Of course, it's the, uh, of course, it's the, it's, it's the, it's the global economy. And of course, there's a number of things that are under our control. It's the, you know, uh, uh, how effective are we in getting to the ramp? How effective are we in pushing? our roadmap in keeping our cost controlled, et cetera, et cetera. Those will ultimately be the things that determine our success in the, in the marketplace and ultimately also, you know, the level of sales that we're going to have. If for whatever reason, um, you know, we, we are looking at a, at, a, at a down cycle, I think these are important
important numbers to, to share. On the one hand, we have the, uh, the, the, the workforce. Workforce, most of our people are, are, are fixed, as you, as you can see here, but we do have flexibility measures there. We do have what we call an hour bank that also in the past has given us quite some flexibility in that, in that regard. You see that uh, more than a quarter of our R&D expense is, uh, is flexible, so that gives you some, uh, some leeway. Very importantly, uh, you know, we have, uh, we have flexibility uh, in our total cost of goods, because as you see here, uh, the total cost of goods, 82% of our cost of goods is actually materials that we source from outside. So there, of course, is flexibility. This is not flexibility you can drive to the extreme, right? I mean, at the end of the day, our supply chain is very important to us. So there is no doubt in our mind that we need to take measures also in a downtime, you know, to, uh, to, keep, to keep our, uh, our supply chain uh, happy and uh, and alive, but it is clear that there is quite some flexibility in here. Also, on the basis of contracts, we have quite some room given our contracts, you know, to have uh, to have uh, to have flexibility with our suppliers. So I think this is a very important element for us to to drive. But as I mentioned, it's important to to make sure that all of our stakeholders, even in the more difficult times that we're able to, to satisfy their, uh, you know, their, 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 their demands and safeguard their existence. And therefore, financial flexibility is another very important element for us. And I think that's a good segue into my final, uh, my, my final comment here, and that's about our uh, capital return policy. Of course, in the, in the days that we're going to enter into, you know, the fact that we're growing our capacity, also the fact that, uh, that we... Um, you know that we're uh, that we're looking at you know potentially slightly slightly more uh, volatile times. Of course, it's important that we have a certain fi financial flexibility there, and I think you've seen us build that uh, over the uh, over the years. So we'll continue to to do that. But we do believe that uh, there will be sufficient uh, and you know substantial money available to shareholders available you know both for a growing dividends, and that's been our policy. Our policy has not changed in comparison to last year. So we'll, there will be ample room for uh, for giving back. Uh, money in terms of growing dividends, and also there will be uh, ample room, we believe, for, uh, for, uh, for share buybacks. Share buy buyback program that we've, uh, that we've uh, announced today is a three-year program of uh, 12, billion, uh, 12 billion euros, uh, of which 2 million shares would be for, uh, for, uh, you know, for, uh, for employees, and the rest would indeed be repurchased and would be, uh, would be canceled. So that's the program that we've, uh, that we've announced uh, today and that we will execute on you know, starting, uh, starting today. Friends, with that, closing remarks. Uh, so investments create value. We've made investments, but I think it's also uh, plain to see that those investments have generated uh, significant returns for the, for the company and for its stakeholders. Substantial growth in the markets, uh, you know, both end markets, but also technology trends that, uh, that we believe are, are, are significant and positive for, for us. Market opportunity, as I laid out, market opportunity for 2025 between 30 and 40 billion, for 2030 between 44 and 60 billion. And all of that, if executed well, will give us ample room to, uh, to pay back money to our shareholders with growing dividends and with, uh, with, uh, with share buybacks. With that, thank you very much. And I'd like to hand it over again to Peter for his closing comments. Do we need this? Uh, I don't know. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know See, what you're going to do. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. So I'm just going to give it back. So, um, yeah, um, closing comments. I mean, uh, I'm not going to repeat what we said, uh, not even in summary. Um, the, the only thing I would like to, um, to, to actually say is that um, the first time that we did, uh, uh, you know, endless days like this or, or capital market days like this, um, I still remember that the company had three billion in sales. And we came out and we said, well, you know, over a certain period of time, we can grow to five billion and people laughed at us. And then we said, when we're at five billion, over a certain period of time, we will be 10 billion and people laughed at us. And so it, it, it's not about, and then we did it again and again. It's, I think it's the fourth or the fifth time that we're doing this. And every time it just turns out that the industry grows faster than we think. And uh, that is basically a structural, uh, uh, um, uh, that underappreciation of the value of Moore's law. And I said it before, um, I'm not going to answer any questions. I cannot answer questions where they used to be 20 years ago, said, Peter, what's the next killer application single? And I said, what are the next killer applications multiple? I have no clue. And the only thing that we do know, and that's, that's why these 
roadmap slides are so important, and that's why the collaboration slides with our customers are so important, that we do see a very clear roadmap that this technology can keep reducing the cost per function. And that the functional increase in the minds of our customers is much bigger than the cost increase, which will create next level applications of which we have no knowledge of. And I think this is um, where we are today. I think we are highly confident in our uh, technology roadmap. We didn't spend time on the technology roadmap this time. We, we also said we weren't going to do it. But I can tell you, and I think it's probably also part of the Q&A that we'll have later, that our confidence in our technology roadmap has gone up, uh, like it should go up with the type of R&D money that we spend. Um, together with our customers, and I can also say that, that the collaboration models with our customers, especially with the leading edge customers, uh, driving the roadmap has been better than ever before and closer than ever before. There's much more, let's say, uh, knowledge sharing, uh, transparency sharing, so we are more aware than ever what the challenges are and how we as industry participants should manage this ecosystem. So having said that, it's a very important basic conditions for um, uh, our expectation that this industry will grow significantly. And, and yes, uh, last year, you could say when we did the Capital Markets Day 12 months ago, we started to prepare this. 18 months ago, um, we are finding out every, every quarter, every year, new types of applications that are not only at the you know, leading edge, the biggest surprise, and I hope that was clear, is also that we're seeing these applications that have to do with sensors, that have to do with actuators, that have to do with, with uh, power management, have to do with energy transition, with the big, big challenges and changes that we're currently seeing uh, in society. I think we will play a pivotal role there, together with our customers and together with our suppliers. And this is why I was very happy with the contribution of Andreas Pecher from Carl Zeiss, because they see the same thing. Uh, we are ready, um, we will grow, and uh, we'll grow significantly. Uh, but most importantly, I think this technology will provide building blocks, very important building blocks, and sometimes corner, cornerstones for the solutions that we need to, together, create to deal with some of these very large societal challenges. Uh, I would like to leave it with that and uh, give the word to you, Skip. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you, Peter. Thank you, uh, Roger. Uh, so we now are gonna take uh, roughly a 30 minute break uh, as we set up the Q&A panel. When we come back, we will have six, of, six members of ASML's management team, which we can then uh, turn the questions over to you in the audience and also uh, you online in the webcast. So if we could come back uh, here at 3.30 p.m. CET, uh, which is roughly 30 minutes from now, uh, we'll start again and you at, uh, on the webcast can take a, a break away from the screen. Thank you. Very good. Welcome back. Uh, we have about, I was told, about 1,200 people online. 
So we'll be taking questions from the audience here as well as uh, online. So joining us for the Q&A, our pal uh, panel of six of ASML's uh, management team, Peter Wenick, you already uh, have met, for those that are joining maybe from the webcast late, Peter Wenick, our CEO and president, Martin Vandenbrink, our CTO and president, Roger Dawson, our CFO. We have Christophe Fouquet, who is our chief business officer. We have Frederic Schneider-Mournier, 